Chocolate milk, that's right. I actually had some milk back in the fridge, but it uh, disappeared, so I took somebody else's. <clears throat> it's the only natural thing to do. <laughs> I will replace it, though. Tilt this just a little bit. You can turn open to uh, Titus chapter 2 in uh, preparation of the sermon. The sermon this morning is titled, Out of the Loop, right? Have you ever been out of the loop on something? Here's basically what it means. The loop is here, and you are over here. That's what it means to be out of the loop. Uh, it means that you don't have the information, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the know-how, um, you don't have the experience, uh, understanding. You just basically are out of the loop on some certain things, and I think we've all been there. I think sometimes it's good to be out of the loop on some stuff. You're like, I don't want to hear you know, about that. Sometimes when I read the news, I just get so stressed out that I'm like, I don't want to read the news anymore. I just want to be out of the loop sometimes on what's going on in the world just because sometimes things just stress you out. But this morning, I want to talk to you about getting into the loop of Christianity by setting an example in youth ministry. Youth ministry um, is about a third of the church. It's a, it's a foundational block um, that Jesus set up. Uh, he said, uh, do not prevent these little ones to come unto me. Youth ministry is extremely important. And every single person in this room has an impact, whether positive or negative, upon ministering to those who are of youth. So if you will, read with me through Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to an evangelist of the church, just like me, Billy Dyer, or, uh, or Clyde. And look what he says to Titus. He says, Titus, as for you, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes and to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. Have you ever been frustrated at slow development? Things don't seem to be going along as fast as what you want them to. Maybe it is the maturity of your child. Maybe it is the position at your work. Maybe it is uh, the love in a marriage. I think that we have all been there when things just don't go as fast as what we want them to. Um, sometimes things in life are just slow, and it's a slow process. We feel like we're not growing fast enough. I know that I can uh, attest to this, that there have been moments in my life, um, a lot of moments, where I don't feel like I know enough, I don't feel like I'm doing enough, um, I don't feel like I'm giving enough, I don't feel like I'm serving enough. And it, when it comes to discovering the cause of this issue, sometimes we don't always find the real root of the problem. I was listening to an audio book uh, this week, and really he said there are really two kind of approaches that you can take to preaching or to understanding God's word. Are and ought. Our focuses on who you are in Christ Jesus. Our focus is on your value and your worth in the Lord, and everything you do stems from who you are in Christ. Whereas there's the ought mentality. Ought focuses on you're not doing enough, and the more you do, the better you feel and the better you'll be. One is based off of grace and salvation in Christ. The others is based off of works in the law. And when it comes to setting an example for youth ministry, a lot of the times we feel like the more that we do, the more that we have our children do, uh, the more that we do in the church, the better things will be, and yet we feel empty inside because we're trying to work and gain our salvation. This morning, I want to focus on who you are, but in order to focus on who you are and go from there, we have to introduce the problem. 
I think a lot of us could attest to this, we can identify with this, that the lack of Christian characteristics in the young, nine times out of ten, directly affects or is directly reflected from the old. It's true. The old set the example for the young. And when I talk with parents, when I, when I look at myself and I say, what kind of youth ministry do we have? The kind of youth ministry that we have is a direct reflection, really, of who I am, both good and bad. And because we are sinners, we tend to take the bad before we take the good. And so what I want to encourage you this morning, whether or not you're a parent, whether or not you're a young adult, whether or not you are seasoned in age, you all have an example that you are setting for the old uh, and for the young. The question is, is what type of example are you setting? You know, when I was a boy, I used to love to people watch. Anybody like to people watch? Yeah? So we would go to the mall, and uh, there was this pizza stand um, that was there, and it had, like, you know, big New York, I like New York-style pizza. Chicago's good, okay, I just prefer New York. And uh, I used to just get the plain cheese, it was delicious. I mean, what's good about that is that you can taste more. The slices are really big, you don't get full very fast, and it's just absolutely delicious. You know, you can get all that flavor in your mouth for just a little bit of the price of the crust. It's so good. Anyway, so I would usually get two pieces of pizza. Pizza used to be cheap back in the day. It was $1.50 per slice, um, and it was awesome. But now you'd be like four twenty five dollars per slice just for cheese. You're like, this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? So I would get pizza, and I would sit in the mall, and I would just people watch. My mom would be shopping, as any natural man would do whenever you go shopping with a woman. What's the first thing that you find? A place to sit. Absolutely. And so I would just sit, and I would just people watch. You can learn a lot from watching people. Um, And and in fact, it's kind of fun. And now that I'm saying it out loud, it does sound a little creepy, you know, that you're sitting there watching people. It's not as creepy as Santa Claus. You know, he knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. I mean, if you ever think about it, Santa Claus really kind of creeps you out a little bit. But when you watch people in the church, right, there have been people that have come to me and they have said things like, you know, I just don't feel welcome. I don't feel loved or accepted. I don't feel like anybody notices me. And what's interesting is that those same people that feel that way, nine times out of ten, during greeting and fellowship, at the beginning of church, they're just kind of standing there, and they're just kind of looking around. It's funny because those who feel most unloved usually are those who who aren't loving. Those who feel most unwelcomed are usually those who aren't out there welcoming people. Those who feel isolated and cut off are usually those who are not um, mingling with people and getting to know people. You know, sometimes when I talk with students and they come and they share their feelings of anxiety and the fact that they don't feel accepted or welcome, I always ask them, well, do you welcome and do you accept people? Well, no one said hi to me today. Well, who did you say hi to? And I always challenge people, you're never going to change the culture in which you live or the atmosphere of the church by sitting back and complaining about it. You have to get out there and you have to do something about it. Those who feel most loved are usually those who love the most. And I think that when we watch people and we feel disconnected or we feel unwelcome, we have to ask ourselves, what type of example am I setting for the people around me? You know, what we're talking about really, getting down to the issue, is the disconnection of relationship. But how do people respond to this disconnection? How do people respond to the fact when they don't feel welcomed or they don't feel accepted? Well, really what happens is they compound the problem rather than satisfying the problem. And I'm going to give you three ways that people usually deal with this issue. And you might be able to identify with one of these three. The first one is that they are present in body but absent in spirit, right? I'm just going to show up. I'm just going to do my thing, check in, check out. But because I've been hurt by rejection, I'm just going to go, get it done, and get out. A lot of, some people do actually respond this way. Because you don't want to feel the pain of rejection. You don't want to feel the pain of isolation. So how do you deal with it? Well, you just tell yourself in your mind, how I'm living is okay, and I'm just going to go in there and not take a chance of loving people. These type of people, the only time that they pray or read their Bible is usually at meals or in time of distress. As Jesus said, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And I think, I, I know that I have been there. There have been times in church where I've been hurt, I've been isolated, I have felt alone, and the easiest way to deal with that problem is just to pretend that you don't care, but it hardens your own heart. Another way that people deal with this issue is to church hop. 
right? You go from one church to the next church. The grass is always greener on the other side. You just, it's, it's a definition of consumerism. And that's what our culture really struggles with. What does this church have to offer me? Rather than what do I have to offer this church? It is a shift in mindset. As Paul said in Philippians, he says, they care only for themselves and not for what matters to Christ Jesus. So we've got two so far. The first one is isolation, who has a hardened heart. The second response is really just to go for what makes you feel good um, and what matters to yourself rather than what matters to Jesus. And the third dysfunctional way that I think people handle this problem is to find excuses. A lot of people will find any excuse that you could possibly give them as to why they should not be involved in church or come to youth group or set the example by being committed. Um, there are, I know that you can identify with this because I can identify with this. There are some things you just simply do not want to do, right? So you're like, sorry, I've, I stubbed my toe and I scratched it on the top and I'm just not going to be able to make it, you know, to your wedding today. You know what I mean? I mean, it's tough. Like, there are things that you just don't want to do. But when it comes to setting the example for, for youth and for the other people in the church, we just want to find reasons why we shouldn't attend or we shouldn't be involved. And yet Paul said... We all must stand before Christ to be judged. The only person that is going to have the responsibility of your actions and your life is you. Not the person that didn't shake your hand. Not the person that didn't make you feel welcome. It's going to be, the, it's going to be you. You are going to stand before the throne of God. Now, I don't think there is a single person in this room who hasn't felt at least one of, the pain, of these pains of disconnection and tried to deal with it in this way. I don't think that there's one person who hasn't felt that way. But really, the climax of this issue is that when we deal with our problems in this dysfunctional way, guess who is watching you deal with these issues? The church, the young men and women of the congregation. Eyes are upon you at all times. All times, whether it's the kids from junior church, whether it's the kids from kids' church, your own kids as they sit here, the youth group over there to the, to the left and scattered throughout the congregation, people, these kids watch you all the time. Just like a little boy sitting in the mall with his two slices of pizza watching how people act and interact. And guess what these little minds do? These little minds soak up every action, every word, every response, and then they emulate it. They copy it. They replicate it. And sometimes it's more severe other times, it's, it's not as bad. But that's the real issue, is that when we live our lives, people are watching you all the time, everything that you do and how you deal with problems in life. So here's your, fir excuse me, here's your first uh, key phrase, is that we have to set the example. I don't care if you're a parent or a young adult in college or a teenager in the Christian youth group or someone who's been in this church for 25 plus years. When it comes down to us, we all are setting an example. I actually sent out a text message this, this week, and I had some people uh, respond. And here's the question that I asked. Who was your number one teacher about God and Christianity? And who should be your number one teacher about God and Christianity? Um, I asked some adults, and I asked some youth, and here are some responses that I got. My number one teacher is Billy Dyer, and my number one teacher should be the Holy Spirit. My number one teacher is Billy Dyer, and my number one teacher should be God. My number one teacher is my grandma, and my number one teacher should be my parents. Um, and that's, that's a really interesting response. And I want you to ask yourself that, this question this morning. Who is your number one teacher about God? Who is that? And just think about that for a moment. Who teaches you most about Jesus and about Christianity? And now who should be your number one teacher? Now I want you to take those answers in your mind and I want you to shift that to the children and to the teenagers of this church. Who is the number one teacher of the children of this church and the youth? Who should be their number one teacher? You got it in your mind? Okay, I want you to hold on to that as we go through here. It's interesting because when you look at what the Bible has to say about teaching youth um, and, and children, the number one person who should be the teacher of those children are the parents. It's the parents. If you will turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 with me, I'd like to read to you five verses out of Deuteronomy. This is set in an old school um, mosaic mindset. Uh, they were really close with families. They traveled together. They lived together. They had excellent teachers, okay? They had Moses, 
Um, they had prophets. They had elders and leaders. I mean, they had a lot of church leadership, as you would call it today, just like we do. And yet when God talks to Moses, this is what God says to Moses. So follow along with me, if you will, uh, starting in verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Sound familiar? It's replicated in the New Testament. Verse 6, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Who is the number one teacher of children? It is the parents. Parents, I want to tell you something. You have the biggest influence on the life of your children. Grand grandparents, you have the biggest influence on the life of your children. You cannot imagine the type of impact that you have on your kids. And a lot of people, they think, well, if I can just get them around the preacher, or if I can get them in the right sports team, or if I can get them in the right school, or if I can just find the right government, let's pay the government a bunch of money to teach our kids about morality and about Christianity and about God and about science. Let me try to pay someone to try to teach my kids the right way. And yet God says the responsibility falls on you. The responsibility primarily falls on you. Now, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Not only do we have this understanding in the Old Testament about whose responsibility is it to teach the youth and the children, but we have the same affirmation in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Look what it says here. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Do not provoke them to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Whose primary uh, occupation, job, uh, authority, responsibility is it in the New Testament to teach the young people of this church? Primarily, first and foremost, it is the parents. Now, Paul lays out this instruction to dads. Dads should be the leader of the home. Uh, first and foremost, moms, you're there too, okay? You have a lot to offer and teach your children, as we will see later on. But this is what's so very important. It does not say, children, bring up your parents and control the home. And in a lot of homes, a lot of homes, children control. Children bring up their parents. Children dictate the schedule, whether or not they go to Bible study. Um, children actually do dictate a lot. And you know what else dictates a lot? Dogs. Dogs and animals dictate a lot. We can't go on vacation for the seventh year because our dog doesn't like it. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy how people treat their animals, you know? Well, I can't get anything new because the dog just chews it up. Get rid of the dog if it's that bad, you know? Why are you going to let the dog control your life? Don't tell me how to live my life, you know what I mean? Look at this. Dr. Pat Fagan is the director of Center for Research on Marriage and Religion, and he's senior fellow at the Marriage and Religion uh, Research Institute in Washington, D.C., after compiling the findings of over 100 independent social scientists over the last two dec decades, the effect that the church attendance had on the lives of kids, this is what he wrote, and this is up for you on the screen. When policymakers consider America's grave social problems, including violent crime, rising illegitimacy, substance abuse, welfare dependency, they should heed the findings and the professional literature of the social scientists on the positive consequences that flow from faithful church attendance. Parents, it is your responsibility. It is your responsibility. But yet, this is, this is how most people, I love chocolate milk, by the way. Uh, when I lived with my grandparents, my junior and senior year in high school, my grandpa would bring home chocolate milk. And I would get really excited. I'd be like, chocolate milk! Literally, that's what I would say. Chocolate milk! Woo! He would make fun of me and laugh at me for it. But this is, this, is, this is what a lot of parents do, okay? And maybe the cameras can zoom up so that way everyone can see it. This, this container represents your child's life. And it was supposed to be a full container of milk, but that's okay. Just imagine that it's full. All children have a full container, okay? There's no half empty, half, half full. It's going to be filled up, but it's going to be filled up with something. The white milk represents the influence of the world, right? Um, whether good or bad. This is the influence from you. This is the influence from their school, from their family. 
And when children get into trouble and they start rebelling and they start doing terrible things, one of the big answers to this problem, let's call the preacher and let's get him involved in youth ministry, which is absolutely great. Here's the problem, okay? This is a Sunday morning attendance, right? One little drop. That's, that, that represents here this morning. And when you don't discuss it, when you don't talk about it after church, when you don't apply it, that's how it stays, unchanged, right? Maybe affected once you swirl it around a little bit. So if you do a little bit of discussion with your children, you might have a little bit of a change. Okay. Now let's take them to youth group. Let's go to Wednesday night and Sunday night, right? So we really get, instead of a half an hour on Sunday morning, we get an hour, and then we get another hour of positive influence. But if we don't discuss it with our children, if we don't say, hey, what'd you learn about in Bible study? If we don't teach our children as our primary responsibility, it just stays, it just stays white, right? But let's say we do discuss it. Let's say we have conversations with our kids, you know, about sex, about marriage, about sin. You can start to see the influence is starting to change, right? But look at the bottom. This is, this is the worst about chocolate milk, right? Any of you who use powder for chocolate milk, shame on you. Hershey's is the number one way, right? Yes, Ralph gets it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Chocolate milk should be made with Hershey's syrup, okay? So you really have to mix it up. Now, if, if we are doing our job, our kids will not only attend Bible study, but let's say they have sports, right? Let's say they're involved in extracurricular activities after school, or they have a heavy schedule and they can't always make it to Bible study. That's life, isn't it? But this is what a constant, steady flow of Christ in your life will look like. You're feeding it every day, and you make chocolate milk the right way, and I totally did not mean for that to rhyme, okay? If you did notice. So you get the chocolate milk in there, and you mix it up, you're talking about it with your kids, they're reading their Bibles on their own, they're praying on their own, and next thing you know, you have more than enough to produce an actual change, to change the flavor. In other words, if you're not getting the illustration, their lives will be changed when you put the right amount of effort and input of Jesus Christ and Christianity. This is what it means to be a parent who's involved in their child's life, a grandparent involved in their child's life. But if you're not a parent or a grandparent, guess what? You're not off the hook. Because look what Titus goes on to say here. He's, he breaks it up in three categories. First of all is older men, right? Older men. It does not mean elders in the appointed sense. We have four elders of this church, uh, prayerfully soon to be five. It, it isn't specifically talking about them. What we're talking about are aged men, right? Older men. This is the challenge that I believe can be applied to every single man that is sitting in these pews, even the teenagers over there in the back. Look what he says. First of all, they must, they must exercise self-control. They don't give in to excess. They don't have indulgence uh, in the world. They're not over... Uh, Occupied sports enthusiasts or hobbies or games or working. They're not self-obsessed with things that just they are totally overly indulged in. Pornography, sex, whatever that is, Paul is telling them they must exercise self-control. For those of you who are sitting in this church and you're a man, this applies to you. Second of all, he says to be worthy of respect. This word actually is applied to God. It means reverence honorable, respectable. It is a deep respect with awe. It's that when someone looks at you and they hear you and they see you, they're like, wow, that guy is a man of God. That's what this word is saying. Third of all, he says, live wisely, clear-minded, temperate. In other words, intoxicants do not delude your mind. You don't have to have life-dominating influences. You'll never be forced or manipulated into moral sins because of the pressures of life. In other words, worldly things do not dictate who you are in Christ. Not sports, not sex, not books, absolutely nothing. Not your job. You're not going to be pressured in work to being someone who you're not. Fourthly, he says, sound in the faith. This is the example that God is setting for you, that God wants you to set, not only for the youth, but for everyone in this church Sound in the faith means to cling to the fundamentals of Christianity. You understand your Bible. You read it. You recite it. You memorize it. You can teach it. You can share it. And then number five, he says, be filled with love and patience. And I think that for a lot of us, exercising self-control 
and being filled with love and patience are probably the most challenging ones for us as men. Love and patience is bracketed by faith. Your doctrine, what you believe, is defined by what type of faith that you have. And here's what he is saying. He is saying love spreads its wings over the duties of our neighbor. Patience is endurance. It's the ability to remain under pressure. The ability to remain under pressure. When your kids are yelling at you, when your wife disrespects you, when people at work are putting you down and making fun of you because you're a Christian, when you get isolated at church, when you feel unwelcome, when you have that pressure to give up, you remain true to who you are and you do not give in. I had a family member always talked about Jesus, went to church, did devotions, always, always talked about Jesus, and he always really gave his kids a hard time. He was the ought rather than the are. He would say, you kids aren't doing enough, and I can't believe they're doing this, and they're smoking cigarettes, and they're getting involved with drinking, and they're having premarital sex. Rick, won't you talk some scent into them? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> that is not my J-O-B, okay? I cannot effectively change all five of your kids in your house at one time. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry. And, but I would feel embarrassed. I mean, he would really rake his kids up and down the coals, right? Here's the problem. He set a terrible example for his children. Terrible example. In fact, it got to the point that when his wife left him and his kids chose to be closer with her rather than with him, in a desperate attempt to feel accepted and loved by them, he met them at, he met them at the bar and drank with them and partied with them and acted a fool. It was ridiculous. That is the example that he was set setting for them. And guess what happened to his testimony over the years? Totally destroyed in one moment. In one moment. Now let's move on to the older women. This is what, this is what Paul tells Titus. First of all, live in a way that honors God. The idea here is reverence. Think about a priestess set apart in the temple, dedicated to worshiping and loving God and serving him. To be reverent in that. Wow, I respect this woman because she loves God. That when someone looks at you, they say, wow, what a woman of God. What a beautiful person on the inside and out. You know, some of the big things that are going on right now, I don't know if you know this, but sexting is a huge issue in the teenage culture and young adult culture. Um, it is when they use their phones to communicate sexual messages and images. And for those of you who have phones, maybe you check your kids, you know, uh, instant messengers or, or, or whatnot. There's actually other applications on their phone that they can use so that you are totally unaware of what's going on. Things like Snapchat and KIK Messenger. There's even folders that looks like something totally different, like a calculator or something like that, that they can hide images in with a passcode so that even if you were to look on their phone, you'd see a calculator and you wouldn't wonder about a calculator. That is what our culture is in affecting our children with. Twitter and Instagram are the new teachers of sex education. Your kids get educated by the government and their teachers about what it means to be a sexual person and what it means to be happy in life. When we talk about a way that honors God, we're talking about not just your social media life, but also your words, your thoughts, your actions. That if somebody were to look at any aspect of your life, moms, dad, teenagers, they were to see someone who loves and honors God. Now, the second thing that he mentions is don't slander. Don't slander others. I think this is a big one specifically for women. Uh, and that's why I think God allowed it to be written here. It means to accuse falsely or unjustly criticize, to hurt, to condemn, or to sever a relationship. Social slander takes place all the time, right? It does. It really does. If you were to look at social media, kids kill themselves, literally, um, often because of, of social media bullying, bullying. And I know that you could probably identify with this. I don't know a single person who's gone to school or doesn't live under a rock that hasn't felt social pressure and slander just, just to hurt and just to, to sever that relationship. The third thing he says is don't drink and get drunk, right? Right? This is a drinking that has the power to enslave. You can't have a good time. You can't go out and mingle with people. You can't go to a party. You can't feel accepted and, and into the group unless you got a bottle of beer in your hand. It is an enslavement. And again, he says, train younger women to love their husbands. Well, how so? He says, be submissive to your husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Nothing blasphemes God's word like a wife who does not respect and follow her husband. Not just blaspheme him, he says blaspheme the word of God. 
He also says, train younger women to love their children. Well, what's the best way to love your children? Is it to give them everything that they want? Is it to always pat them on the back every time they make a mistake? Absolutely not. The single best way you can love your children is to teach them in the ways of the Lord and to use your life as an example. That's the best way to teach your children. He says to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes. Here's the idea. The idea is to not be busybodies talking about other people, slandering other people, not gossiping in idle time or flirting with the man down the street. This is a love that isn't always natural. This type of love is an intentional love that bears under difficult times. In other words, you always do the right thing because you're a woman of integrity. That is what Paul was saying about setting an example. And then he ends it with this, as I said before, so that the word of God will not be blasphemed. Let me, let me say something, church. The church depends upon the character of women. The church is defined by the character of women. The world is going to judge this church on how our women live their life. You are a foundational bedrock stone of what Severn Christian Church is all about. And your lifestyle, your example is a, found, uh, a foundation, a bedrock stone. And then he goes on, third of all, leaders, right? Elders, evangelists like me, deacons. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to highlight a few that I think uh, would be most important. He says, I want you to promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Now, I'm not going to teach you to get drunk. I'm not going to teach you to divorce your husbands and your wives. I'm not going to teach you to be apathetic in your Christianity. I'm going to promote the type of living, a, a wholesome living through my teaching. That's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. He says, I want you to encourage young men to live wisely. This is something that I cannot not do. If I am around young men being in the youth ministry, I'm not just going to be somebody who is there just to simply hang out and play video games. I can't help but talk about God and his word and to live wisely. This is something that is ingrained spiritually in me. And this is what we should do as leaders. He says, I want you to set the example in all good works. In other words, I want you to do something godly and set the example. Let me give you an illustration. Does anybody know some countries who were neutral in World War II? Anybody? Name some. Switzerland, Ireland, Spain, Portugal, Iran. A lot of these countries were neutral, right? Neutral means you're, you're, you're out of it. You're not cold, you're not hot. You're not against them, you're not for them. You're basically neutral. Well, guess what happened to some of those neutral countries? They became occupied, right? They're nothing and wanting to be out of the loop turned into actually something for the negative. They became occupied by the Nazis. Um, and so here's what I'm saying, is that just simply to remain neutral in Christianity eventually will be occupied by an opposing force. Nine times out of ten, it's not a good one. We have to be actively involved and engaged in the lives of our students. Nothing says failed commitment like being committed to everything else but the most important thing in Christ Jesus. I mean, think about it. We tell our youth, God is number one. Following Jesus is the most important thing that you can do. To follow him is the best thing that you can do with your life. But when it comes to conflicts with that number one most important thing, nine times out of ten, the thing that steps aside is the most important thing because life gets in the way. And that's what I want to challenge you with this morning is to set the example with your time. Make the number one thing the number one thing. That the life that you live would be an example, not only to your children, not only to the people of this church, but those in your community, because they are watching you. Their eyes are upon you. The greatest enemy of your family and the youth in this church is the idol of time. They get the time trifecta. School, eight hours a day, three hours of homework. Sports, four to five hours a day on top of that. Social life, they got to remain actively engaged, right? They can't be a loser who's a hermit under a rock, so they got to have a social life. And those three things combined together pushes God out of the picture. It's a Sunday morning. Well, we, we went to church. We went to church. If you're out of the loop with the children of the church, I want to encourage you this morning to get in it. 
read books and articles online, attend their activities, encourage them in school, but more importantly, most importantly, set the example with a godly life and make Christianity a priority. Teach Sunday school, volunteer for junior church or kids church, attend our renewed weekend, by the way, which is June 19th and 20th. It is a family, fun-filled weekend of spending time together, studying God's word, playing games, just being present with each other and bonding with one another, setting the example with each other. It's going to be an awesome weekend, and if you miss out on it, you're really going to regret it. Hug them, love them, encourage them, and the second point, which is, by the way, much shorter, is enlist in the call. Enlist in the call. Sign up for duty. No longer am I not going to set the example for my children. Have you made mistakes in the past? Absolutely. Have you doubted yourself? Sure. Do you doubt yourself right now? Absolutely. But if you want to gain the respect of your children, if you want to gain the respect of the youth of this church, repent. Turn around. Why? Because Christ died for you. Christ forgave you. And I guarantee if you approach your kids with a humble heart, they will forgive you. And your relationship can be rekindled and they can respect you and they can love you. And most importantly, they can follow you if you are willing to change If you are willing to enlist in the call, sign up for duty, and do the right thing. So here's a final thought for you. Uh, You know, Angel and I, we kind of have split up duties uh, with housework. Anybody else do that? Moms, dads, yeah, you're like, you got this and I got this. Well, I usually clean the kitchen um, in that area, and Angel will take care of the bathrooms, right? And so we usually kind of do it together. You know, if I'm cleaning the kitchen, she's cleaning the bathroom or whatnot, and, um, and there are some days when the bathroom gets so dirty that I feel like I'm going to lose my mind, literally. I'm like, I cannot take it anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this bathroom's got to get clean. <laughs> but guess what? I don't mention anything about it. Do you know why? Because the moment that I mention the bathroom, guess who has to clean the kitchen? Right here, right? And I just want to watch Netflix. I want to read a book. I want to watch the grass go for a couple hours. Anything but clean and having to clean the home. I don't think anybody likes to clean except for those random weird people. You know what I mean? <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I don't want to discipline myself in those moments. And it is, it is tough sometimes. Not just the cleaning, right? But if you want your children to learn, if you want the children of this church to learn, it's going to require you to learn. If you want the children of this church to serve, it's going to require you to serve. If you want the children of this church to attend, it's going to require you to attend. If you want them to follow Jesus, it's going to require you to follow Jesus. One Sunday morning in 1865, a black man entered a fashionable church in Richmond, Virginia. When the communion was served, he walked down the aisle and he knelt right up here, what some people call the altar. I just call it the front of the church stage. And a rustle of resentment swept the congregation what is he doing? I mean, think about it, right? Someone's serving communion, and they're coming up here kneeling down here. That'd be kind of awkward and weird. People would be like, look at that dude up there. You know, he's kneeling down. What's he doing? This is weird. We don't do that here. And it says, the people were beginning to say, how dare he? After all, believers in the church used a common cup. And then suddenly, a distinguished layman stood up, and he stepped forward to the front of the stage, and he knelt down beside the black man. With Robert E. Lee setting the example, the rest of the congregation soon followed his lead. For those of you who don't know who Robert E. Uh, Lee is, he's basically one of the most popular leaders of our time in early American history. And that's the simple fact, is that people will follow your lead. And if you want to lead the children of this church and youth ministry, if you want to get into the loop, the number one way to do that is to set the example by following Jesus with your lifestyle, being involved. If you're here this morning and you haven't followed Jesus, maybe you're a mom or a dad, maybe you're a a student, maybe you're a young adult and you've never been baptized into Christ and you want to set that example, you want to become a part of the body of Christ, you can do that this morning. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And so I'm going to ask that you stand. And if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do that. And we will baptize you into Christ if you'll stand and sing with us.